of the things I, I understand from last week's session is that you had an introduction to fake news. And the way um, I see it is all things, go back to Wikipedia definition of fake news, is the false or misleading information um, that's presented as news. This often has an aim of damaging the reputation of someone or an entity or making money through ad revenue. I think that's a pretty good definition. And we really saw fake news enter the lexicon of American life after the election of 2016. In fact, I think Newsweek named it the word of the year that year or the phrase of the year. So what we're interested in and what Susanna and I have been thinking about a lot is the long history of fake news in US history. So take for instance, this screenshot. This is a diary entry by John Adams. And I just want you to take a minute if you can See the quote, I'll read it out loud to you as well if it's too small. Um, so this was September 3rd, 1769. And what you have is the screenshot of the original diary entry um, and a, a screenshot of the Boston Gazette. So he writes, I spent the remainder of the evening and supped. The evening was spent in preparing for the next day newspaper, a curious employment, cooking up paragraphs, articles, and encouragement occurrences, working the old political machine. So what do you notice right away about the quote and what was his intention? I think what we're beginning to see here is an entree into thinking about, again, the long history of fake news, not to make our students feel skeptical about news media, but to understand the way in which news both shapes popular opinion and is shaped by public opinion. So we have two guiding questions for you today. Um, how can an understanding of news from the past help shape media literacy today? It's our contention that by bringing historical examples into the classroom, we can help students develop the type of scaffolding they need to um, so sort of transfer those skills into the contemporary context of fake news and misinformation. The idea here is that this history is distant from them. It's not sort of the immediate heat of a current event. And so perhaps by being able to really take um, a clear nuanced analysis of these, um, these examples from the past, students can begin to understand um, not only media literacy today, but also get a sense of that long history of journalism. Again, this is the aim here is not to make students skeptical about news, but to encourage them to consider issues related to sourcing and perspective taking. And also again, to understand that across history, media has both shaped and is shaped by public opinion. So throughout this, um, the next couple of um, slides, what we'll do is go through a series of activities that we think you may be able to integrate into your own classroom. As you know, one of, the, um, one of the best ways to support student learning is to provide them with scaffolding, just like a building under construction. If you give them, a, it, it starts with scaffolding and eventually that scaffolding can be taken away and the building will stand on its own. And so the idea from learning sciences is that by giving students a scaffold or heuristic to work through, eventually these will become more automatic and they'll be able to incorporate them pretty easily in their own thinking or analysis. So in this particular strategy that I'd like to start us with is discourse analysis. Perhaps you're familiar with it. Um, it's often used in the social sciences, particularly social um, sociology and anthropology as a way to analyze language. So it goes beyond just the sentence to really look at the latent messaging and cultural text. So here's some four example questions you might ask if you're engaging in discourse analysis. So the first is what's notable about the artifact, the image or text, what compositional elements do you notice? So compositions here, important here because of the way images and text may be layered next to each other what seems to be the message, and then how does this media impact or reflect public opinion? So let's try some examples together. So I'm gonna give you first this Time Magazine cover. I've removed the caption for a minute, but just kind of getting started here, looking at 
this in this um, this image I've given you in the chat window, maybe jot down a couple of things that you see right away, symbols that stand out to you, or any latent meaning you might find in those symbols. Yeah. So in the chat, if you just want to um, kind of quickly um, mention what symbols you might see or any latent meaning. Good, you guys are getting us started. Wholesome pie, American flag, patriotism, right away Thanksgiving, pie. Yeah, you're on to it here. As American as pumpkin pie. So I think it's brilliant that you um, picked up right away on pumpkin pie and Thanksgiving instead of the apple pie. Nationalism, great. All right, so then what if we take, if we add the caption to it? In what ways, if any, does your um, understanding of the meaning of this artifact or this text change? So the caption reads, Thanksgiving 2001. Next week, American families will set their tables, count their blessings, and discover how their lives have changed and how they haven't. Pulled up the chair. So does this create new symbol or new understanding about the meaning in any way for you? And so, it, yes, right. So it's focusing on the after effect and of 9-11 um, in America, we must be thankful for, et cetera. Now, what if I change this one more time on you and create a new caption that says the leading Native American activist questions the true meaning of Thanksgiving. How now does the symbolism change or the latent meaning? Yeah, so it takes on a different feeling. This now it looks like this American flag sort of maybe stabbed in the pumpkin pie, less of a notion of um, nationalism and more of a sort of iron ironic, as someone said, or sort of a stealing of um, now it's more accusatory of American standards. Nice, good. All right, so this was just to kind of get us started thinking about how we might use discourse analysis to encourage students to, to again, look at um, not just kind of the, the literal imagery and text, but then to draw out additional meaning from it. So one sort of um, well-known example from American history that you all have seen and no doubt taught with, I'm, I'm assuming, is this engraving, a print of an engraving by Paul Revere which was sold by Paul Revere in 1770. So again, if we go through um, our questions here, what's notable about this image? What compositional elements do you notice? What seems to be the message? And how does media impact or reflect public opinion? So let's start off, if you could, in the chat, Jot down things that you see are notable and compositional elements in particular. So we're going to start with those two, notable and then compositional elements. How is this image arranged? Nice. So you mentioned the color. Many of you are talking about the defensive position of the colonist as opposed to the offensive or really well organized positioning of the um, red coats on the other side. So for many historians that um, refer to this historic engraving as, as a pretty effective piece of war propaganda. Why was that? What seems to be the latent um, messaging here in this image? What seems to be the messaging, right? Yeah, so who's the attacker? Who's the aggressor in this particular imagery? And in fact, if we, if we wanted to ask students to start with this, we might ask them then to go a step further towards understanding how this may have impacted or been reflective of public opinion. And so to do that, they could look at other sources from the time. For instance, here's a screenshot of the Boston Gazette and Country um, Journal from March 12, 1770. And you see these coffins here and some of the text. Let me show you a little bit more um, clearly 
what the transcript of that was. So if you take a minute to look at this, In this particular example, um, it appears similar to what we saw in the previous, that these um, boys were being attacked by these um, soldiers who intended to murder people. And in, in some ways then we're beginning to see a little bit of a discourse between this particular source, this text, and the previous engraving and the way in which they may be reflecting similar opinion. If we take it a step further though, we might ask students to um, look for other corroborating evidence or perhaps contrasting evidence. So for example, they could look at the transcript of the trial um, for the murder of Crispus Attucks, Samuel Gray, Samuel Maverick, James Caldwell and Patrick Carr. And they, in this particular um, piece, you'll see that the captain says that they were attacked and that if they were um, a great many number of heavy clubs and snowballs were being thrown at them. So here we're asking students to go a step further towards trying to make sense of what happened in the event, but also beyond that, how it was presented and perhaps why and to what ends it was presented as either a massacre or as a, as a um, sort of an attack by colonists on these soldiers. To, to go a step further though, we'd have to link up, I think, discourse analysis with sourcing. So you've probably seen um, similar types of heuristics to this one when it comes to sourcing. We know it's really important to ask our students to understand how um, and when an art, a, a cultural artifact was created. So we asked them to put it in the proper context. So where was this piece of information first published? Who created it? What do you think the main purpose is? You know, this is it to persuade, inform, distort. And then what is the overall tone and what specific claims are made? So again, using discourse analysis plus sourcing, we could return to Paul Revere's um, engraving or if these other artifacts we had to begin to kind of piece apart some of the information about when was it produced, what's the purpose of it, what was the tone. All of this again to the ends of helping students hone those skills of looking at media as a con social construction that again reflects and shapes public opinion. To take this a step further, you might look at sources that represent Crispus Attucks. It wasn't until later, so if we go back and, and look at the Paul Revere engraving, you don't see Crispus Attucks featured very prominently in this picture. Whereas in later depictions of the Boston Massacre, you see him front and center. So again, here we would ask students to go, engage in not only a discourse analysis, what do they see happening? In fact, both images seem to be presenting a pretty similar story to the Paul Revere graving. However, they prompt more prominently feature Crispus Attucks. What's the difference when you just glance at the date? What do you think seems to be the difference in the depiction? Why Crispus Attucks featured so heavily in these 18 and these from the 19th century? Yeah, right. I think you're on to something. He begins to serve as a symbol of patriotism and valor but also for the abolitionist movement, right? He becomes Booker T. Washington, mentions him in an address. He says, we find him choosing the better part in Crispus Attucks and Negro, who was the first to shed his blood on State Street, Boston, that the white might enjoy liberty forever, though his race remained in slavery. Also, Martin Luther King Jr. references him in his text. And so he becomes a sort of historic symbol um, of, of the abolition movement and again sort of featured more prominently as a hero in this particular time. So moving on a bit, I think it's part of our um, part of what we're interested here is not only to um, kind of look at these um, public media as a social construction, but to also think about 
the history of newsprint and um, in newspapers in the United States. So one nice example you can bring to your students is Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper. The Library of Congress has digitized the entire collection. And so it's a really nice way for you to have students do some real deep digging into the archives. It, um, and it st still includes some pictures. So Frank Leslie's newspaper was established in 1855. and was considered the first successful pictorial newspaper in the United States. Um, and he, he found most of his stable readership after John Brown's raid. So we're gonna look at some of the imagery from that. And by 1860, his circulation had reached 164,000 people in the United States. So what we're seeing is kind of a, um, media revolution at the time, nothing on the same scale as what we're seeing today, but with the advent of cheaper printing and being able to share ideas more widely through newspapers, it was fundamentally changing the way Americans share news at that time, and particularly will have an important effect um, during the war years. So again, if we used our two frames of reference of discourse analysis and sourcing, we might look at the imagery that's depicted in these newspapers of John Brown's raid, again, to see what kind of messaging is made, to see what kind of compositional elements are, are offered in order to explain the event. And if we know that after this particular event, he begins to have more of a Northern readership, perhaps it will also help us frame our understanding of the latent messaging. One thing we could have students do is compare that to other newspapers. Again, these are all available through the Chronicling America collection in the Library of Congress from around the country at the time. So here's one from my home state. This is the Southerner um, and from Tarboro, Edgecombe County. And they wrote about the startling news of, the Har of Harper's Ferry in very derogatory terms, probably not surprising. Another example is from the Iowa transcript who describes it much more differently um, as um, kind of being a part of a, of a longer um, struggle or need to um, disrupt slave power of the South. And then the third example is from the anti-slavery bugle from Ohio that described him and um, John Brown and the other martyrs at Hot Harper's Ferry. So again, these papers can provide a snapshot about the regional differences in reporting. And again, I think helps students sort of hone their skills around analysis and sourcing, all in an effort to better understand the manner in which media both, again, shapes and is shaped by public opinion. And probably no one knew this better. Yep, yeah. go ahead. Well, I would just add um, in terms of uh, John Brown, one of the interesting things, speaking of newspapers, is that you see within the news the ways in which slaveholders in the South suppress the news. I mean, we've all heard the typical story that enslaved people rejected John Brown and, and weren't involved in um, the raid on Harper's Ferry, but historians have done the research and we know that's not actually the case, that there's a great deal of restiveness among the enslaved people, but the false perception that enslaved people had not been involved came from Southern newspapers who said, well, of course, when John Brown came down and tried to involve our loyal slaves, our loyal servants, they said no. And so that narrative was spread publicly in an attempt to shore up the institution of slavery and emphasize that enslaved people were loyal to their beloved masters and mistresses when in fact, uh, we know from other historical records that this wasn't the case. Yeah, cool, thank you for that. At, yeah. So as I was gonna mention, um, Abraham Lincoln, of course, um, is known for his, uh, his um, I guess, political savvy in growing to understand and appreciate newspapers also as a political tool and as a mean of self-advancement. So again, he was kind of on the, the cusp of the newspaper age. And during his career, he tried to really nurture a positive relationship with the press. Um, he's often quoted as saying, public sentiment is everything. So like today, again, as I mentioned, advances in technology, including faster printing press and the telegraph were kind of revolutionizing journalism. 
and led to the sort of rapid rise of circulation. At the same time, there was sort of a more hyper-literate environment for the Civil War. And so during the period, more and more people were having access to, to news and to imagery. And so one thing I would suggest, in fact, this is a picture of Lincoln posing with a newspaper, is that students can examine imagery from Lincoln's presidency to examine the way in which he hoped to shape public opinion. So for example, here he's without his hat, he has a book in hand, um, here he's meeting with in the field uh, battle. And so what is he, you know, what again, what are sort of the latent messaging that we can um, look to in the way he was trying to shape opinion? Um, one other kind of interesting source from the time, if we're interested in having students look at outright and blatant fake news, is the gold hoax. And so the Civil War gold hoax of 1864, this is a screenshot of, um, from the New York World and New York Journal of Commerce in which um, the authors were hoping to manipulate the gold market. So they published this fake news report about a draft and construction of 400,000 new troops, hoping that would depress the market and then in turn um, enable them to do sort of a short sale and to make money. So we're seeing a variety of um, something that may be somewhat familiar to us from just um, sort of Lincoln's efforts to sway public opinion through positive messaging in the media to these sort of outright hoaxes that um, could have had major implications for the country. So again, just um, in kind of closing this first section, just wanted to remind you that we um, the emphasis here is helping us understand how news of the past helped shape media literacy today. So helping students uh, examine the past to um, develop their skills. And then the next part we're gonna look at is how have journalism and news media shaped US history? So at this point, I'll turn it over to Susanna. So thank you all for being here with us today. And um, as Megan mentioned, what I'm gonna do is to engage with a couple of ideas that Megan brought up, but I'm gonna look quite a bit more intensively at one specific instance in which um, historical actors use the news and use journalism in order to shape public opinion with very disastrous results. And so I'm gonna talk about the white supremacy campaign in North Carolina in 1898, uh, which you may all know culminated in the Wilmington riot uh, massacre and coup d'etat known as the only uh, coup d'etat in American history. And so I'll give a little bit of historical background at the beginning and then um, I'll have an activity for you all to engage with that I share with my students. Actually, I have two different activities. So first, the historical background. After the overthrow of Reconstruction, white Democrats dominated on the statewide level in every former Confederate state. Democratic leaders sided with commercial banking and railroad interests, which resulted in democratic policies that were really increasingly unrepresentative of the state's population, both black and white. North Carolina was the only state where black and white voters and leaders allied together and succeeded in dislodging democratic rule in the 1890s. And once they uh, achieved political power, they brought about reforms that benefited ordinary folk, both white and black, through the so-called fusion movement, which was an alliance between uh, Republicans as well as third party populists. Democrats resorted to a campaign of terror in order to return to power, one that culminated in the Wilmington riot, massacre, and coup. And newspapers, as you may know, were central to this campaign of terror. So I want to talk a little bit about the Democratic leaders who were responsible for this white supremacy campaign. The architects were the Democratic Party leader, Fernifold Simmons, orator Charles Acock, and newspaper editor, Josephus Daniels. Uh, Daniels summarized the white supremacy campaign as the combined efforts of men who could write, men who could speak, and men who could ride. I've included on the slide a link to a secondary source by 
historian Tim Tyson on the white supremacy campaign. And the source would be good for your own reference on the white supremacy campaign, or also as a reading assignment for high school level students, as well as if, if you wanted something for the classroom. Democrats spread the white supremacist message through newspapers and speeches throughout the state. Uh, Josephus Daniels, the editor of the Raleigh News and Observer spearheaded the newspaper campaign. His newspaper printed article after article and cartoon after cartoon denouncing fusion rule and promoting white supremacy. Following the white supremacy campaign as a formal political campaign, there was violence. And I want to talk about that. Uh, the Democratic architects of the white supremacy campaign relied on newspapers to then so here I really want to emphasize the importance and the role of newspapers in the white supremacy campaign. They relied on the newspapers to publicize the threat of so called Negro domination, as they called it, in areas where there were few black people, and even fewer black office holders, fewer black voters. Now, Wilmington had a black majority and a prosperous black business class. Under fusion, new white and black leaders came to power, including four black aldermen, local office holders. Democrats, and so Wilmington was in Eastern North Carolina, Democrats pointed to Wilmington as the awful fate of communities if people tolerated Republican populist domination. And so what Democratic newspapers did was to spread the message of the Black threat from Eastern North Carolina, where you had larger populations of Black people. They're the darker shaded portions of this map. They spread this message to Western North Carolina because white people there, in the from the perspective of white Democratic leaders, were not aware of the threat because they didn't have a large proportion of black voters they didn't have a large class of black office holders and so what democratic newspapers were able to do is they spread this message this fear of negro domination through the newspapers and newspapers were absolutely essential for this purpose because people white people in western north carolina from the perspective of white democratic leaders were not fearful enough of negro domination and they were allying politically with black people so the Democratic white supremacy message spread through newspapers as well as speeches called upon all white men to um, act. As Daniel stated, one of the Democratic leaders, the white supremacy campaign needed the combined efforts of men who could write, men who could speak, and men who could ride. The men who could ride meant ride in terror campaigns. Democratic newspapers incited white men to, com to, com to combat Negro domination, to intimidate Black people, to put them in their place, and to kill them if necessary. And I've included a few examples of these calls to action on this slide. Now, as part of the white supremacy campaign, white Democratic leaders incited a Black on white, white rape panic. They asserted that there was an epidemic of assaults by black men of white girls and women. Democratic newspapers reported a few examples of black men who were accused of raping white females. And then Democratic newspapers used these cases to argue that um, to argue that these incidences were a consequence of emboldened black men under fusion rule. They asserted that fusion authorities let um, black rapists go unpunished, and they argued that democratic rule, that a return to democratic rule would return security to white women. And so in the aftermath of these calls, or as a consequence of these calls, you did, um, it, within North Carolina, there were uh, a number of lynchings of black men who were accused of raping white women. Uh, there was one in late 1897, two in 1898. What you see here on the slide is one letter published in a newspaper by a white father who claimed that his daughter had been raped by two black men. He blamed his vote for the fusion ticket and vowed to vote democratic in the future. In that case, a mob of white men seized the two accused black men and lynched them. Many in the crowd of about 2000 people participated by firing rounds into the hanging bodies and spectators preserved souvenirs, including 
bits of the men's clothing, the rope, the tree, which they later made into walking sticks. Also, during the white supremacy campaign, armed gangs of white men terrorized white and black Republicans and populists, the most famous being the red shirts. After the red shirts that they wore, they targeted Republicans and populists by disrupting church services, breaking up political meetings, threatening voters, firing into black houses, whipping black people, controlling the streets and blocking the roads to the polls. Um, and of course, as you know, the white supremacy campaign uh, culminated in the Wilmington riot massacre and coup d'etat. This slide shows a picture of a white mob during the Wilmington riot posing beside this destroyed office of the Wilmington Record, which was a black newspaper in the riot massacre and coup. White supremacists charged through black neighborhoods, killed dozens, perhaps hundreds of black people. We don't have an accurate count and drove prominent black families as well as black and white office holders into exile. And so I have another activity that you may all want to consider and doesn't include disturbing images. And so perhaps this could be better adopted into some of your classrooms. So in the breakout session, you might want to consider and discuss this assignment. Um, I, what I do is I provide, there are links in the slides to two primary sources. One is an account of the events at Wilmington, specifically from the news and record, which had been so prominent in the white supremacy campaign. The other, a contrasting account of the events at, at Wilmington is an, is an unsigned letter from a black resident. Uh, I have an excerpt on the slide, but I also, you can also, I also have a link to the full letter. It's very powerful and I think would work very effectively in your classrooms. Um, so if you want to go ahead and make sure you have the slides and uh, we can send you all the breakout rooms. Okay, everyone, I am sending you now. Welcome back. One of the things that I think is really important about Wilmington for this session and the webinar more generally is that I think it's a real clear and strong lesson in how white supremacists use the power of media to shape perceptions, but not only to shape perceptions, but also to spur people to violence, to attack black and white people who had done little more than to exercise their right to vote and to overthrow a democratic elected, democratically elected government. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that as, as, um, as since we're talking about fake news and the role of news in shaping history, you see a very clear example in the events that we've talked about today. Um, I, I didn't wanna run into too much into our time for Q and A, so I'll, so I'll just stop there. Um, I, th I think with the article, um, if you prep kids and have other small, like easier things before um, that, it's like it says this, but what does it really mean in between the lines? And then so by the time by the time you bring the article in, then maybe you might have at least one or two kids that would see, oh, they're overturning the representation, the duly elected people of that area, um, instead of reading um, from the viewpoint of a white supremacist that um, the whites were wounded and they had to replace the mayor. Like maybe if there's like, if, you're, if you've been getting kids to do that all along, then they might be able to pick up on that on their own. Um, the, the way the, the slant of the newspaper and what it's really saying and I think that'd be a powerful life skill for the rest of their life to be able to kind of have a nuance about things that they see um, out in the world, like messages and stuff like that. Well, I also do think that the, the contrast with the other primary source would be very powerful for students as well. And I, and I do think it, it sometimes matters how you, what order you give students readings in. Um, and so, like um, like you said, you want to provide the historical context about what we know really happened, maybe, and then provide the the white supremacist perspective on what happened. But I also do think the the contrast with 
the uh, black resident, the woman of Wilmington and her, her experience of the Wilmington riot, I think would be really powerful for students. I'm an English teacher and I 100% believe that if you're a history teacher, give them the unsigned letter, partner with them on it. As an English teacher, I could have a field day with this. When any unit that I'm teaching that is about um, like Black History Month or racism or just generally anything that's about empathy building, it is so powerful, particularly in that last paragraph. You know, and she also speaking of what I, one of the things I was thinking about when Megan showed uh, those images centering on Crispus Attucks, right? The emphasis during the abolitionist movement, the representation of Black people as citizens fighting in the American Revolution. And here you have a sort of different take in this letter where this woman says, essentially we're being hunted down. How can I understand myself as be as belonging, as being a citizen? So you almost have a, a, a sort of flip version, the claim of black citizenship, but here um, the alienation that people could feel as a result of the terror campaign waged against them. Were there any uh, questions for me or for Megan? I wonder too, and maybe this, uh, yeah, I was making sure I wasn't on mute, that um, uh, I know you didn't get to go all into this in detail, but wasn't it very significant? There was uh, an African-American uh, editor who wrote a letter in response to the, uh, white woman perspective and he was basically run out of town and became there was even a, a um, oppression of journalism that tried to contradict the the news that was being used i did not go into that for the purpose yeah. of the time i, <laughs> I, I, I understand <laughs> but so the picture of the white mob in front of the wilmington record office that's his newspaper office i mean it's one of the few black dailies within the united states and he was run out of town Absolutely. So yeah, we thank you guys. And so for next week when we return, um, we're going to try to pick up the same theme, um, but with a little bit of a different nuance. We're going to try to look at how to teach students to become expert readers of the news. Um, so it'll be kind of the same theme around um, media literacy, you know, uh, sourcing, contextualizing. But I think one of the things that I want to make sure we clarify too is kind of about the history of journalism and that uh, the rise of journalistic ethics, et cetera. And then, yeah, as someone said, you know, kind of thinking about um, propagandizing and how this um, plays out in, in media. And so I think that we can kind of build on um, what we've had here today next um, next week when we see you again as well. So, um, and certainly you have our contact information if you have other follow-up questions or things that you would like for us to um, in particular um, share next week, um, we'd be happy to. I'll be talking about Thomas Jefferson. <laughs>